Welcome back to Up To Something, where today I have a spine-chilling sequel to the last video, The Most Dangerous Plants You Should Never Buy From a Nursery. In part one, we delved into the treacherous greenery lurking within seemingly innocent plant nurseries, exposing the sinister secrets of nature's most hazardous offerings. Brace yourselves for part two promises an even deeper dive into the realms of perilous flora. In this chilling continuation, we'll unravel a dark tapestry of botanical malevolence that will make your heart race and your palms perspire. From innocuous-looking foliage to deceptively enchanting flowers capable of striking fear into even the bravest souls, I will present a compendium of plants so dangerous that they should be banished from nurseries. Whether you're an avid gardener or just a beginner, embark on this perilous journey with me as I shed light onto the shadowy corners of the horticultural world where beauty and danger collide in a mesmerizing dance. Remember, Knowledge is your armor against nature's hidden perils, and this video may save your garden from a potentially lethal encounter. Let's unlock the gates to a botanical Pandora's box and expose the chilling secrets of these forbidden flora. And don't worry, I'll turn the music down this- If you haven't met before, I live in the northeastern U.S. in Zone 7, and many of the plants that I will cover in this video are ones I have experience with in that zone. You can probably tell from my accent that I'm a New Yorker. So your experience may be different depending on your zone and region. I would love to know where you're from. On my last video, I received comments from viewers in other countries and it blew my mind that my small channel was seen by people in other parts of the world. I know YouTube is a worldwide platform, but I was still so surprised. So if you live somewhere exotic, please leave me a comment and tell me where you're from. It would really make my day. And by exotic, I mean anywhere off the eastern seaboard of the U.S. Because while I love to travel, I haven't gotten very far. First on our list is the Mexican Evening Primrose. Originating from Mexico and also native to the southwestern U.S., has become widespread in many regions of the U.S. and is viewed as invasive due to its rapid growth and competition with native plants for resources. Its long taproot makes traditional weed control methods ineffective making eradication challenging once it takes hold. It can spread either through underground rhizomes or through seed. Additionally, it's able to survive drought conditions and can recover from dormant periods even after appearing to have perished. A commenter on my previous video said that a six-pack of this plant spread throughout his neighborhood and even damaged the pipes to his house. That said, if you see this at your garden center, stay away. The pink mimosa tree, also called the Persian silk tree, is a tree that can grow between 10 and 50 feet tall. This tree is imported as an ornamental plant due to its sweetly fragrant flowers and fern-like leaves. Mimosas have six inch seed pods that split open to release the seeds and they easily seed. The silk tree is highly adaptable to different environments, allowing it to outcompete native trees and shrubs in disturbed areas. It can grow in various soil types, reproduces quickly, and can even resprout after damage, giving it an advantage over other plants. Unfortunately, this can result in dense strands of silk trees that shade out native plants and deprive them of soil and nutrients. Consider the eastern redbud as an alternative to the mimosa tree. For those seeking a tree with springtime blooms and ornamental size similar to the mimosa, the eastern redbud offers an excellent alternative. Unlike mimosa trees, the eastern redbud is not messy and it won't spread like a weed. This small tree is indigenous to the eastern United States and can withstand harsh winter conditions in zones 4 through 9. The California privet is widely known for its use as a privacy hedge in the Hamptons, and it's also recognized as an invasive species in certain parts of the United States. This includes California, Hawaii, Washington State, Texas, Missouri, Alabama, and multiple mid-Atlantic and northeastern states. It's listed on the noxious weed list of 46 states. Despite its invasive nature, the plant is admired for its fast growth and dense branching that can be manipulated into visually appealing hedges that provide complete privacy. 
The California privet is also incredibly resilient, thriving in full sun to partial shade, as well as windy and salty conditions, making it an excellent option for the coastal areas of Long Island. The common periwinkle, Vinca minor, is a beautiful plant with a destructive impact. Initially introduced to North America as an ornamental ground cover in the 1700s, the common periwinkle remains a popular choice for landscaping. However, this plant has escaped cultivation and is wreaking havoc in natural areas throughout the eastern U.S. It thrives in open and shady sites, easily escaping from old home sites into the surrounding forests. The periwinkle's rapid growth rate allows it to form dense mats along the forest floor, effectively outcompeting native plant species. A good alternative is woodland phlox, which does spread but does not become invasive. Commonly referred to as cornflower, bachelor's button is frequently found in wildflower assortments and as potted plants that are sold in big box stores and nurseries alike. This invasive species produces an abundance of seeds and has the potential to take over dry meadows, fields, and grasslands with ease. It's a plant you should think twice about growing because it's made its way onto the USDA's list of invasive and noxious plants. It's prohibited in North Carolina and classified as invasive in Tennessee, Georgia, and Maryland, and has been making its way into the prairie lands of the northwestern U.S., It's recommended that this plant only be grown in areas where it's native, which is in Europe, and not invasive. As an alternative to bachelor's button, consider planting penstemon, which is a favorite of pollinators. The multiflora rose is a beautiful but invasive species. Multiflora rose is a type of rose indigenous to Eastern Asia, specifically in China, Japan, and Korea. While some of these roses are still available for purchase in nurseries due to their attractive features, they are known to invade numerous habitats such as fields, forests, stream banks, and wetlands. Moreover, dense thickets of these roses can prevent other vegetation from thriving and pose a threat to a nesting of certain native birds. In pastures, they have the potential to form thickets that can ultimately reduce grazing areas for livestock. It's worth noting that seeds of this species are available for purchase on Etsy. This is another plant that spreads like wildfire in my yard. Multiflora roses were everywhere when my family first moved in, and we spent almost a decade trying to eradicate it. The ever-popular knockout rose is an excellent alternative. It typically grows to around 4 feet tall and blooms from late spring to summer. This plant is also resistant to disease and can withstand the heat, humidity, and various diseases that are common in hot climates. The knockout rose will make a great alternative. You'll have beautiful flowers, and it won't spread like a weed. Japanese barberry is a deciduous shrub with thorny branches and paddle-shaped leaves, and it's a popular choice for hedges and landscaping. It comes in a variety of cultivars that offer different colored leaves such as red, orange, purple, yellow, and even variegated. Since its introduction into the U.S. in the 1860s, it's been able to thrive in a variety of environments such as wetlands, woodlands, and open fields, and it has spread rapidly throughout the Great Lakes region. While its growth can displace native species, it also alters the soil chemistry, making it more alkaline and changing soil biology. The Japanese barberry dense foliage provides a humid environment that serves as a haven for ticks. Some scientists believe that the increase in Lyme disease may be linked to the spread of Japanese barberry. While there are some sterile varieties available for purchase, the invasive types can also be found online and in stores. Winter creeper, an evergreen vine often used as a ground cover or shrub, has become a popular choice for landscapers due to its versatility and fast growth rate. However, this plant behaves similarly to English ivy by smothering the forest floor and climbing up trees, which can cause them to fall prematurely. Furthermore, its berries are quickly spread by birds to forested areas. A native alternative to invasive ground covers are the Christmas ferns, which is a clump-forming fern, meaning that it stays put and gradually gets a little bit wider, but it doesn't spread to form dense, connected colonies the way some other ferns do. Another alternative is creeping thyme, which will be beautiful, smell heavenly, and spread quickly, but does not have an invasive nature. 
Oleander was not previously thought to be invasive until recently, but the California Invasive Species Council issued a red alert in the year 2000 when it was discovered on the Sacramento floodplain near Redding, as well as in Southern California. Most recently, Oleander made it onto a list of ornamental plants that was becoming invasive in Arizona. The oleander plant is indigenous to the Mediterranean where it thrives in temporary streams. Its seed pods are equipped with feather-like hairs which help it spread easily on the wind. All parts of the plant are extremely poisonous and can induce cardiac arrhythmia and eventual death. The lethal dose of green oleander leaves for cattle and horses is just a few leaves. It's also believed that breathing in the smoke from burning oleander can cause poisoning. I've taken a peek at my local chain store nursery as well as online and I was shocked to see how easy it was to buy these plants, many of which are on state and national lists as being invasive. What's worse is that there's often no tag or sign warning the consumer that the plant is invasive. Of course, plants can be invasive in one area and not in another. If you're not sure if a plant is invasive in your region, there are so many websites you can use to search. One is your USDA State Extension Service, and another is the website for the Invasive Plant Atlas. I will post the links for both of these in the description. If there's an invasive plant on this list that you love and it is invasive in your area, you may be able to find sterile hybrids of that plant. This is true for butterfly bushes, burning bushes, and some barberry plants. Some people have had success growing invasive plants that spread through extensive root systems by planting them in galvanized containers and keeping them trimmed. You don't want to use plastic though because it can eventually crack and then the roots can escape and that's true of anything else that is prone to breaking. It's important to note that this approach will not be effective with plants that spread through seed. Also, this is not an exhaustive list. If I tried to include every invasive plant in this video, it would take 100 years. So tell me, what did I miss? What would you like to see me cover the next time I do a video like this? While the majority of plants bring beauty, oxygen, and tranquility, there are those few that harbor a sinister side, capable of inflicting harm upon our gardens. As you wander through the garden centers and nurseries, remember this cautionary tale. Seek guidance, ask questions, and familiarize yourself with the potential risks before you bring a new plant into your home. Thanks so much for watching today. This is a new channel and it would really help me grow if you would like, comment, and subscribe. Have a great day.